The Boy Scouts of America is the largest and oldest youth organization in America. The BSA was born and modeled after the Boy Scout Association in 1908, establishing its charter in 1910. This is a story of one of the oldest Boy Scout troops in Virginia and the first Boy Scout troop in Williamsburg. Troop 103 has been in Williamsburg for over 90 years and has been continuously chartered since 1924. The troop has provided the scouting program to hundreds of boys and is proud to count numerous civic, professional, and political leaders as its alumni. The scouting program has three central aims, to build character, to foster citizenship, and to develop fitness. It was a different world in 1924. Calvin Coolidge was president, Vladimir Lenin died, and Stalin began his bid for power. Ford was selling Model Ts, IBM was founded, and the first Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was staged. It was two years before Reverend Goodwin's efforts resulted in Rockefeller's founding of what is now Colonial Williamsburg. Scouting was new when Troop 103 was established in 1924, Barely a decade had passed since the founding of the Boy Scouts of America in 1910. An iconic image in Troop 103's history is the presentation of the troop's flag by President Calvin Coolidge in 1926. I'm Alan Outlaw. By profession, I'm a professional archaeologist. As someone interested in history in the troop, I noticed the uh, troop flag which was given to the troop in 1924 by President Calvin Coolidge and I was amazed that the piece survived in a frame uh, but, but I was concerned about its long-term preservation at the time um, I believe we were celebrating the 75th anniversary of the troop and um, I wanted it to at least last another 75 years and we now have <clears throat> uh, the piece mounted with a plaque uh, and accompanying information as to when it was awarded. So it should last for quite some time again. Um, my name is David Nunn. At the present time, I'm Scoutmaster Emeritus. I've been an Assistant Scoutmaster, Acting Scoutmaster, and Scoutmaster for a total of 30 God only knows how many years, since 1975. Well, other than Calvin's Coolidge giving it to him, and uh, you can see the holes and things in it where it was well used. Um, then in the latter part of 1950 or so, Jimmy ordered a new flag. Uh, it lasted until I was Scoutmaster, and it was getting rather threadbare, and we were going to retired we had ordered a new flag and somebody came in and stole that and stole the american flag and stole all of our rib ribbons they had broken into the scout uh, storage room and taken them but the five stars on the flag represent young men that were members of our troop they were killed during military action. Uh, there were two during World War II, two during Korea, the Korean conflict, and two during Vietnam. The troop was five years old when the stock market crashed in 1929, followed by the Great Depression and World War II. These were the days long before cell phones served as cameras and Facebook provided a digital record of everyday life. Nobody carried around a camera, and getting film developed was not cheap. Images of this time are rare. The earliest story we have about the troop is from a September 1932 Virginia Gazette article about the sons of Bruton Parish Rector, Reverend Goodwin. The Goodwin boys attended separate summer camps and each received an award. Howard Goodwin earned the first class award and his brother William earned second class. Both attended summer camp near Richmond in 1932. William stayed for six weeks, but Howard left after three weeks to attend the fourth International Jamboree near Budapest. 
By the late 1940s, the troop had about 30 boys and met in a Quonset hut donated to them by the Navy. The scoutmaster was Lewis Clary, and the sponsorship of the troop shifted in 1948 from the Williamsburg Council of Churches to the Williamsburg Junior Chamber of Commerce. My name is Robert Allen McGregor, and uh, I am a retired uh, uh, government uh, employee. But on the way out that dirt road, there was a Quonset hut. It looked like a World War II, World War I Quonset hut. And it was evidently given to Troop 103. And they used that for camping. And there was like maybe, maybe you could sleep about 12 people in there. 1924. The troop was formed with 13 boys. The first two patrols were Flaming Arrow and Alligator. And they met at Matthew Whaley School. During World War II, uh, George A. Pitts Jr. was the scoutmaster. He was a 4F, so that's why he wasn't in World War II. Was scoutmaster from early 40, 41, until 1946 or 47. Uh, the next scoutmaster was Ross Cottingham. Ross Cottingham was the first Eagle Scout that Troop 103 had. He was scoutmaster until 1950 when Jimmy showed up in town and the troop was just about ready to fold. From what can be gathered, Troop 103 hit its low point in the early 1950s. Okay, uh, my name is Jim or Jimmy Etchberger. My current involvement with Troop 103 is as an assistant scoutmaster, which is where I like to be. As far as the activity level of Troop 103, it never, we, we were never close to dying out in my lifetime. Uh, I believe during World War II, the history has it that um, there was some issues there, but only because, again, it was World War II. You know, people were pulled in all directions. Uh, a lot of men had to go off to war. That left moms at home with, you know, young children. So there wasn't a lot of time for, for moving people around. So World War II was a little uh, slack as far as members go. And I believe in the 30s, there was a time when we got down to just a few boys uh, and maybe a dozen or so, and that was it. Uh, but you have to remember also that during that same time frame, lots and lots of troops were folding. Troop 103 never did fold. Troop 103 got through it, uh, and a, a lot of that is credited with adult volunteers. You know, if you can get the adult volunteer to commit, then you've got the basis for a troop to grow around. And it was uh, chartered by the Williamsburg uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce, or the JCs. Seeing this decline in the troop, the Junior Chamber placed an ad in the newspaper that promised $2 a night for anyone willing to be the scoutmaster. James A. Fuller stepped forward but turned down the two dollars. Hi, I'm Doug Marty. I am currently the scoutmaster of Troop 103. I've been the scoutmaster for four or five years now. They were down to uh, five or six scouts, as I understand it. Uh, and they took out an ad in the paper, um, and Mr. Fuller replied. He said, I'd be willing to do it. They offered to pay him, actually. And the ad in the paper was to pay him. They didn't have another troop in this town at the time. And, uh, and he said, well, no, I'm not gonna take any money. And, um, and so, you know, he became really a legend in scouting. Jimmy Fuller was an Eagle Scout, a Vanderbilt graduate, a Navy veteran of World War II, and a former professional scouter. He had just moved to the area to take a job with Colonial Williamsburg. So he became Scoutmaster in 1950. Um, there were 11 or 12 boys in the troop, and they met at the Old Methodist Church, which was at the corner of Boundary and Duke of Gloucester Street. He believed in uh, 
the outing and scouting. Uh, went camping, learned that we never canceled trips because of a little bad weather. If he went on the trip, it rained. He was a CB radio enthusiast. His call sign was the Rainmaker. And I believe it because some of the worst rainstorms I've ever been in has been when we were camping. Um, he was dedicated to the boys. Uh, he liked to see them advance. And in fact, his office was right down the hall from here. Um, back then, um, every scout who wanted to join the troop had to make an appointment here in the Goodwin building and um, walk in and introduce himself as before he could be a scout, before he bridged, and sit down and, and get interviewed by Mr. Fuller, which as you can imagine as a 12-year-old would be pretty intimidating. You can look around this room and this is an intimidating place. I definitely went through uh, Scoutmaster conferences with Mr. Fuller. Uh, the, the process was, he, he was Director of Employment at Colonial Williamsburg, and he had an office right down here in Merchant Square, and on Thursday afternoons is when he did Scoutmaster conferences. So Thursday afternoons after school and before 5 o'clock, uh, your parents had to have you down there uh, in Class A uniform, and if you were not in full Class A uniform, like I said, you didn't get past the secretary to get to Mr. Fuller. And then the, the uh, conferences, of course, depending on the rank, uh, would take anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes, and except Eagle, which could go up to a couple hours, uh, as Mr. Fuller would sit there and reminisce about all the camping trips and all the good times and all the bad times that you had. But it was a very impressive thing uh, because you actually had to go someplace else in order to have that conference. Starting in 1951 with three boys, Jimmy Fuller began to rebuild the troop in the basement of the Williamsburg Baptist Church. He asked each boy to bring a friend to the next meeting and the troop grew by 10 boys. Before long, there were three dozen scouts in the troop and membership grew to over 50 boys by the mid-1970s. When I joined the troop, there were 110 boys in the troop, and they were talking about splitting it into two troops at that time, but didn't. Fuller emphasized the boy-run program that Troop 103 has become known for. When I joined scouting, the, my scoutmaster was Mr. Fuller, and uh, he was he was just fantastic. He was what you would expect of a scoutmaster. I lived the scouting life in Troop 103. Uh, I it was a lot of fun. Uh, I was learning leadership uh, all along, uh, not knowing it. Uh, mostly it was just fun. The adventures we were having. Uh, Troop 103 ran a little differently than it does today. Uh, but the basis was the same. It was still 100% boy run. Uh, and the, my patrol leader was uh, Chip Dericott when I first joined. And Chip uh, right away took me under his wing and he was probably 16 at the time. And he was an excellent patrol leader. Uh, my very first patrol meeting, and I'll never forget this, it'll probably be my last thought when I die, was we had just gotten a brand new chuck box and as the newest member of Flaming Arrow Patrol, I got to paint the Flaming Arrow on top of the chuck box. And I still have the top of that chuck box today hanging up in my garage with my arrow on it. The troop was um, probably more boy run than it is today. And I say that only because my perspective as a, as a young man, as a, as a boy, was the fact that my senior patrol leader, my assistant senior patrol leaders, my patrol leaders, is who I saw doing everything up front. And f for the years through that, we ran our own things. That said though, 
We weren't pulled in so many different directions like teenagers are today. You know, we weren't told it, you know, and encouraged through school to get in all these school activities because there weren't that many school activities. The extracurricular activities was baseball and that was it. So there wasn't swimming, soccer, football, lacrosse, all these other things that pull scouts today in different directions. So we had a lot of extra time in order to run what we were running. And so that's what we did. Growing up in the troop, the leadership positions that I did do, because I had mentioned earlier that I learned a lot of leadership, I, ha I was an assistant patrol leader. I was a patrol leader of uh, Flame and Arrow Patrol. Uh, I was assistant senior patrol leader. I was quartermaster. I was senior patrol leader. But uh, the leadership, leadership was gained through working with another scout, an older scout who was, you know, your, your leader. And, and uh, they taught you. I, I was actually taught the leadership by the boy leaders in the troop who were above me. And if I needed straightening out, we got straightened out. If I needed guidance, they gave guidance. If I needed advice, I could always go to them for advice, which back then I used to. I'm Peggy Abbott Miller. I live in Williamsburg, Virginia, and have become attached to Troop 103 and PAC 103. It's been my pleasure to serve as a den leader and den leader coach and a number of positions in scouting. And Mr. Fuller was the person who brought this team of scouts together through many years, and other people have followed his step footsteps. He was also instrumental in the founding of eight other troops, lending out senior scouts to help kickstart these new units. And we don't have any concept of how many people we have really been able to touch through this program. A scout is helpful. Jimmy Fuller told the Daily Press a story that perfectly illustrates this point. One winter, Williamsburg was hit with a series of heavy snows, and Scoutmaster Fuller broke his leg. He awoke one morning to find his walk, driveway, and car cleared of snow with a note from one of his patrols. The foxes were here. Boys will be boys, and scouts are not angels. Mischief will prevail. On a camp out, Mr. Fuller decided to do a lost boy drill. He directed a senior scout to be the injured boy and hide in a specified location. During the search, the boy wasn't where he was supposed to be. Mr. Fuller found the scout at the bottom of a cliff, face down and unresponsive. He immediately sent the other boys to call the rescue squad while he stayed behind. After five minutes, the scout couldn't hold it any longer and started laughing. He told Mr. Fuller, it was all a prank. Fuller ran after the messengers to prevent a false alarm to the rescue squad. When he reached them, they too were laughing. They had all been in on the prank from the beginning. Well, his first thing was he liked the boys to be in uniform. And uh, he had a terrible time with berets. The boys didn't like them. The only thing they said they were good for was potholders. So in 1978, 79, that's when we decided to go to the red baseball hat. And he said it made it better. The kids would wear those. But um, uniform, advancement, um, behavior, he fired fired one senior patrol leader. Uh, we, they were, that was before I joined the troop. Down at uh, Kings Mill, that's where we used to go camping before it was started to, to be developed. And some of the scouts decided it would be nice to throw eggs at each other. So he came out and told George Firebeck Jr. He says, if there's one more egg thrown, you're fired. 
So here comes through there an egg. Whap! Hits up the side of Jimmy's tent. George was fired as senior patrol leader. Funny thing about that, when George finished college and was either 23 or 24, he married Jimmy Fuller's oldest daughter. <laughs> so, he, you know, he, he was just a good person. We had some good times. We went on a lot of good trips. Uh, this historic trip, uh, Jimmy loved those and he liked my cooking. He fired all the other assistants from cooking. So, he in particular liked my chicken and dumplings. Mr. Fuller served as Scoutmaster from 1951 until his death in 1980, touching the lives of some 500 boys who passed through the program during his tenure and building the foundation of the troop we know today. He really got sick in 79, and he went out on one camping trip, and he only came, I went in town and got him and came out and visited. We were camping out at my farm, and there was an old seat out of a school bus sitting over in the edge of the woods. He and my dad sat there and told tales to each other for about three hours as we watched the boys build uh, pioneering project. Uh, we built uh, two or three towers, uh, a number of things. So that was his last camping trip. In 1980, I convinced him to come to the banquet because that was his 30th anniversary as Scoutmaster. The James A. Fuller Award was presented for the first time at that and he was giving some duck decoys that he was, you know, really liked. He got sick during the latter part of the uh, program. So Loretta and I and Miss Fuller took him to the hospital. He died seven days later. And this was April. So, and I became a scoutmaster in June. But Jimmy's always been an influence on what I do in scouting. Mr. Fuller was a, a stand-up guy. He was uh, well known in the community, and he was a he was a hands-on scoutmaster. So his approach was number one. He knew every boy in the troop. We were a smaller town back then, so it was easier to kind of learn names and. But he. But he also knew us, which was really neat. He knew what we did outside of Scouts. He knew what we did, you know, how school was going. Um, I, the only thing I can say about Mr. Fuller is he made my scouting as a youth the best. So I, I think it was, I, I'm, I was lucky to have such a dedicated Scoutmaster as Mr. Fuller. During Jimmy Fuller's illness, Dave Nunn served as the acting scoutmaster. He assumed his role full-time when Fuller passed away. Remarkably, Mr. Fuller and Dave Nunn served as scoutmaster for over 50 years combined. During that time, the scouting program experienced exceptional growth. Fuller and Nunn laid the foundation of the troop we know today. Was just, and I said it earlier, he was a, a top scoutmaster. He was had a probably one of the best knacks of reading scouts that I've ever seen. Uh, probably almost as good as Mr. Fuller's. And then he became friends with Mr. Fuller, and they became very close friends. He, he was an assistant scoutmaster, and when Mr. Fuller got sick, Mr. Nunn became the acting scoutmaster. And that was important because nothing changed in what a scoutmaster was to us. We still had the same type of scoutmaster, which was very good for what was going on with our troop. When your scoutmaster 
gets sick and it's a, such a strong scoutmaster and you're expecting that person to be there and to have that continuity made a huge difference in how Troop 103 got through our scoutmaster. Mr. Fuller was, he had some major health issues and then he was basically passing away slowly. He had emphysema, uh, he was scoutmaster and Mr. Nunn would say this till his dying breath that he was only acting in Mr. Fuller's behalf. He was not the acting scoutmaster. He was not scoutmaster. He was assistant scoutmaster acting in behalf of Mr. Fuller. People got upset, you know, when I was acting scoutmaster. You're making all these decisions and you you know, you're trying to take the job away from Jimmy. Well, on the average, I saw Jimmy three times a week. If I was working down in a restored area, I would slip in and see him. After I got off work, I'd go by and see him. Uh, Loretta and Kimberly, our daughter, we would go down and see him at least one night a week and we'd talk about what was going on in the troop, what he wanted to do. And uh, for example, the uh, awards that were handed out in 1980. The Scoutmaster has the final word on the awards when they're given out. Jimmy changed one award after we, you know, made those selections. And uh, people got upset about it. Why did you change it? I says, I didn't change it, Jimmy did. So, but, you know, some people would be happy Whatever you did, they, they think that something's wrong or you're trying to do something wrong. When, uh, when Mr. Fuller did pass, uh, and it was a very sad day uh, for our troop, um, I mean, Mr. Nunn then um, became Scoutmaster. Uh, it had to be approved by the committee. The committee chooses the Scoutmaster, not the, the it just doesn't happen. It has to be chosen. And uh, there was some hemming and hawing, but uh, those personalities got in the, in the way of things. But the bottom line is the troop already knew who the scoutmaster was, and that was Mr. Nunn. Uh, what, was, what was neat about it from, uh, from a youth standpoint, and I was uh, 15 at the time, is uh, I became senior patrol leader and Mr. Nunn was pretty much acting a lot as scoutmaster at that point. Uh, Mr. Fuller would come on occasion, uh, but he was acting as scoutmaster, so I dealt a whole lot with Mr. Nunn. At the same time, he'd go over, okay, now that we've discussed all this and, we're, and this is all set, now you have to go get it approved by Mr. Fuller. Uh, so I, I got to deal with him as a youth a whole lot. Uh, Mr. Nunn, handed me my Assistant Scoutmaster badge. I've always worked with Scouts, but there was a transition. Once, I, once he handed me my ASM badge, uh, it was, at that point, I'm an adult. So you have to transition as an adult, from a, from a Scout as an adult. And Mr. Nunn's advice, Dave gave me some really good advice of, you know, you have to work as an adult now. And uh, so I just, I just kind of watched him and how he dealt with, with uh, scouts and situations and how he would give enough advice to a scout, but not too much to a scout. And realizing, oh, that's okay, there's a the trick, you know, you don't do it for them, you give them enough to, so they can do it for themselves. And that's the first thing that stuck with me. Um, I, I, I think that's probably my, the best thing I ever learned from Dave Nunn was you learn by doing and you can't learn by doing if somebody does it for you. Mr. Nunn was a scoutmaster that was just like the scoutmaster I grew up with. And being associated with him and being able to learn from him, but he also knew me as a youth and knew what my qualities were, we were able to form a great team. My strength was camping, and that's why he 
pretty much just let me take over the camping aspect of Troop 103 all through his 25 years of being Scoutmaster is I set most everything up. I got to work with Dave on setting up council camperies where we had 3,000 members of, of the council coming to a camperie. Uh, we used to do a lot of big things together, but the main thing we always did was centered on Troop 103. Uh, Dave and I are still great friends today. Uh, he's 75, 76. Um, his knees bug him, so that's why he doesn't, he's not out camping anymore, but he still comes out and sees us, and he still takes a huge interest in Troop 103. We still talk, uh, we talk two or three times a month probably, and is he gonna camp with us anymore? I probably don't get to camp with him anymore. So, but on camping trips, we'll still see him out, especially when we're camping out at the Hidden Acres Farm. My name is Michael O'Neill. I work for Dominion Power. About April of 81, I, got, I met a gentleman on a job site, and the gentleman's name was Dave Nunn. We were working in a place called Seasons Trace, where we had had a secondary faulted cable burn into the telephone. And Mr. Nunn and myself started talking about Boy Scouts. And he told me he was a scoutmaster in Williamsburg. And I said, well, that's kind of funny. He says, I'm a scoutmaster in Ivy Hill in Hampton, but I'm fixing to move to Williamsburg. Uh, we got to talking about Troop 103, and he told me how involved he was, and he was a scoutmaster. And he pretty much gave me an invitation to come check out one of the meetings on Monday night. And that's how I got involved. Another little interesting story is, I don't know whether he says, I found him, but I think he found me, is Mike O'Neill. Mike and his crew that he was working with, and they say Mike did it, he'd cut a telephone cable. And the guys on the crew knew me, so they told Mike, they says, you better watch out for him. He's going to be, really be mad at you. So after a while, <laughs> He kept peeking around the truck at me. They, they told him, he says, you know, he's really a nice guy. My son's in his scout troop. And so Mike says, he's in Boy Scouts? So Mike came over and told me his Eagle Scout, and he had a little tiny, tiny scout troop down in uh, Denby. And uh, we we'll know if he could help. So that's how we got Mike O'Neill. Can you describe the transition between when Fuller was Scoutmaster and when you took over? There really wasn't any. It basically stayed the same. I, I didn't change anything. We, you know, the uniforms and the camping and not canceling camping trips and doing high adventure. We probably did a little bit more high adventure uh, than what Fuller was Scoutmaster. The first High adventure trip uh, for canoeing was Dan Landis. That was when Fuller was was scoutmaster. He had bought a, I say, a, I think it was a Volkswagen bus, and he took ten kids in it to uh, Northern. Canada, uh, Northern Tier, yeah. Northern Tier, and. Uh, they did their trip, was on the way back, and when they were coming through uh, Illinois, the bus blew up. So they had a time getting the kids home. The next high adventure was uh, involving water was Sabumic, which was kind of like uh, Northern Tier, but it was in Maine. After the year after we went, they uh, closed it down. Uh, Jim Smith took 14 boys up to that. He was an assistant scoutmaster. Of course, we went to Philmont every year. A couple of things that I started was the Great American Shootout, which I think every boy that's ever gone to it had fun. We had one young man that had never shot a shotgun. Started out, he flung it up in the air, the first one, and broke the pigeon the first time. He broke like 10 or 12 in a row before he missed one. 
and I understand he's one of the better ones that was on the skeet team at uh, University of West Virginia. We were having problems getting kids to go camping the week before Thanksgiving, so we decided to have a cookout for them. Well, there were 37 boys and four adults. We got two turkeys and a ham and all the fixings to go with the Thanksgiving di dinner. And we smoked the turkeys and the ham and they had such a good time. All of the 37 mothers were mad at us because of the comments that they received Thanksgiving about the meal they cooked. So the next year, we invited the parents and they decided the boys were right. Says some of the best turkey and ham and venison they had ever had. The turn of the century welcomed a new succession of scoutmasters who have championed variety in camping and high adventure, as well as new forms of community service. Although there have been a number of scoutmasters over the years, each has made an effort to carry on the traditions and culture of the troop. To this day, a love of camping, a commitment to community service, and a keen respect for the scout uniform are still a major part of Troop 103. We are very, you know, we're really blessed with a, a very large contingent in our troop. It's, the troop has always been a, a fairly medium to a large troop. Right now, it is by far the largest I've ever seen it. Mr. Nunn is, had, a, had a lot to do with that, and maybe Mr. Fuller. I mean, the Boy Scouts, is this troop has always been very service-oriented, always been to help the community, there for the community, there for people. Anything that would need a need or a want or something like that, the, the troop has come together to, to do something, whether it's, you know, uh, something the church needs, something that the community needs, something as far as the 4-H camp or the county or this, that, and the other, you know, whether it's an Eagle project or whether it's a service project, we've, we've really worked a lot. One of the things that I, that I really like and enjoy about the longstanding tradition of Troop 103 is you either wear all the uniform or you wear none of it. And it was always instilled that the reason why you wear the uniform all or none is because it makes everybody equal. Everybody wears the same uniform. You know, if somebody wears a pair of designer jeans or designer pants or whatever it is, you know, it, it offsets them. Versus if everybody wears the uniform from start to finish, socks, pants, shirt, scarf, hat, they're all equal. And that's what I like about it. So like I say, Mr. Nunn had probably been Scoutmaster not more than a year or two after I took over. Uh, of course, the Mr. Nunn, when he retired, Jimmy Etchberger took over as Scoutmaster. Uh, Jimmy Etchberger, he was senior, assistant senior patrol leader when I joined the troop. I gave Jimmy his assistant scoutmaster badge on his 18th birthday. Um, and he's still here. But Mr. Nunn was scoutmaster for 25 years. And then he retired as scoutmaster and I was made scoutmaster of Troop 103, which I thought would be one of the coolest things in the world for me. And in all honesty, I am a I'm a really good assistant scoutmaster. I'm not a good scoutmaster. Uh, I don't like the politics of being a scoutmaster and having to deal with the parents of being a scoutmaster. And uh, it takes a certain knack. And people have said I'm, I'm a good assistant scoutmaster and that's when I was the happiest. So when I was scoutmaster, I, uh, I got burned out in doing things that I now had a greater appreciation for from, from Mr. Nunn and from Mr. Fuller of being able to do that it wasn't my, it wasn't my thing. So I maintained Scoutmaster for about four years and then I just, uh, at one of our banquets, I just abruptly turned over the reins to Mr. C on a temporary basis till the committee could confirm the new Scoutmaster but I retired as Scoutmaster that night. And uh, the only person who knew about it was Mr. C, Mr. Coppinger. 
nobody else knew about it, including my wife, who was just uh, jaw dropped as everybody else. Uh, because everybody expected me to be there forever and ever. And because that was sort of the game, I mean, that was sort of how it went, you know. My Scoutmaster was there for 25 years. Mr. Nunn was there for 25 years. They kind of looked at, well, you're going to be there for 25 years. And uh, I didn't quite make 25 years. Uh, Mr. C took over, made a fantastic uh, Scoutmaster. But again, he's sort of like me. He likes being an assistant Scoutmaster because you get to work more hands-on directly with the Scouts. Being a Scoutmaster in a troop are as large of ours as ours, you don't get that hands-on with each Scout like you, you know, like you want to do. I took over Scoutmaster from Jim Etchberger. He'd been um, running the troop for about three or four years, I guess, after Dave Nunn retired. And he was getting real frustrated with the administrative load. He wanted to focus more on camping and outdoor stuff, and so he he retired to, didn't retire, but he moved over to the committee side of things, and I took over as Scoutmaster. I said I could do it. I had committed to uh, being Scoutmaster of the National Jamboree and running the Wood Badge course, so I said, you know, I've got a couple of years I can do this, but i got some other things I've already committed to several years out. I guess my focus was was more than anything else to try to create an atmosphere where kids were having fun. I mean, I don't think if, if they're not having fun, they're not going to come to scouting. So um, some of the trips that, that uh, we did when I was Scoutmaster um, worked out real well. We, um, we went to West Point, the West Point Jamboree, or Scoutmaster's uh, Campery, I guess it was, which was a really cool thing. That was a, the first time we'd ever done anything like that. Uh, that was one trip that was really cool. Um, we did some things with the, uh, I think the Menaclair trip, uh, the, the, the canoe trip was the first time we did that on, on my shift. And I think also the bike trip that we did down the, the Colonial Parkway was another one. But again, I was, I was trying to get outside of the box. I mean, you know, you, you get a sameness going on and I think part of the challenge is to try to, to, to do something different every year, 20, 30% of your trips. But um, we did a fair amount of local camping as well. But uh, it was a good time. I, I had a great time doing it. Uh, ultimately, I, uh, I moved on to do the Jamboree thing, and, uh, and Doug Marty picked up the baton and, and ran along. And I think anybody who's Scoutmaster is, is not really jumping in to try to make dynamic changes, but more to keep the troop flying at an even keel and hopefully gaining altitude, you know. Uh, each time, you know, maintaining the traditions yet pushing the boundaries a bit uh, on what we do and how we uh, look at things. Mainly because I think kids change, you know, uh, the environment that current scouts are in are totally different from when my kids were in uh, the scout troop. You know, there was no internet back then. Cell phones were big things that were as, bad, as big as a lunchbox and only rich guys had them, you know. so. Uh, it's a dynamic system. It changes every day. Uh, we've gone through Mr. Nunn through my tenure, Mr. Etchberger, Mr. Coppinger, and now Mr. Marty. So that's four Scoutmasters in 30-something years. I mean, that's, that's, that speaks a lot for itself, that we can keep a Scoutmaster that long. A Boy Scout troop's a dynamic thing. It's, it's, it's like a living thing. It changes, it grows, it contracts. It, 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 it goes through all kinds of, of configurations. Um, when I became fully involved with Troop 103, it was a whole different, a different animal altogether. Uh, it was smaller in numbers, uh, but quite active. Uh, we met in the small old, old scout room, which is now the choir room, which is maybe a third of the size that we normally met in. Um, but it was still, in, in some very basic ways, the same troop it is now. Now we uh, are probably a little more um, involved in, 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 I guess, high adventure things. Uh, it seems like we, 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 we seem to do a whole lot more nowadays. I don't know whether that's just a function of the times or uh, the troop, but uh, we were busy back then as well. 
I think one thing's been really neat is that we've been man managed to take a lot of our troop on these big events. Uh, I think that's been a real benefit and why Troop 103 is successful is that we're able to do things that um, other troops really can't do. They might send a kit or two to Jamboree or two or three to Philmont, but geez, we just sent almost 20 kids, uh, 22 to Philmont. Yeah, so so that is awesome. I mean, that's that's terrific. From a small town like this, it's it's amazing. Um, I think that's part of what everybody likes to do, and that's why the troop is successful. You know, uh, going to summer camp notwithstanding, but the fact that we've got a program now that a kid can join when he's 11 years old and enjoy all the way through 18 years old, and and come back and work as an assistant scoutmaster later. So it's it, it covers the bases. Mr. Marty, has, Doug has made a fantastic scoutmaster. He's, he can deal with all the politics that goes with Boy Scouts and every organization has some politics. But at the same time, he still gets to work somewhat hands-on with scouts. He doesn't get as much hands-on as we do, but he still gets you know, a certain amount of time with the scouts, but he is an excellent, excellent scoutmaster, and I hope he stays around for the 25 years. One of the things that um, when I first became scoutmaster that, that worried me a little bit was the election of the, of the senior patrol leader. Um, in, in the sense that what if, if they don't choose wisely? Um, I have not experienced that in any way, shape, or form. Um, the scout, the uh, senior patrol leader who I've worked with have consistently been top quality scouts. The, the troop has always shown great um, judgment and respect for that position. Um, and so my job becomes quite a bit easier in that sense. If, uh, and if you think about it, it, we've got good senior patrol leaders uh, or great senior patrol leaders and, and great assistant scoutmasters, my job is to make sure we kind of keep the train on the tracks. So I don't have to change a lot um, as, as you well know, um, I don't get involved much in Monday meetings. You guys manage those. You, I some, sometimes get a call saying, would you do this or that for Monday? But I don't talk to anybody on Saturday afternoon saying, what's the plan on Monday? I honestly never have an idea what's going to happen Monday night when I walk in. Scouting is all about teaching life skills. It's about community service. It's about life skills. It's about leadership. But no matter how far anybody goes within the scouting program, those life skills um, just like the name implies, or something you're going to take with you for the rest of your life. And, and certainly the most basic of that is going to be cooking. Uh, things like cooking, first aid, um, all of those, no matter whether you just make scout or tenderfoot or life or eagle, um, those skills are, are absolutely critical. Uh, that being said, uh, with the numbers of merit badges offered, there's, um, there's a huge opportunity for a lot of scouts to learn something that that may well apply to their profession going forward. Uh, it may be videotaping film like we're doing here today. It might be plumbing, electrical, um, nuclear energy, car repair. All of those are, um, are skills that, that could lead one to a career. In his last letter to scouts, Baden Powell wrote, the real way to get happiness is by giving out happiness to others try and leave the world a little better than you found it. And when your turn comes to die, you can be happy and feeling that, at any rate, you've not wasted your time, but done your best. Be prepared in this way to live happy and to die happy. Stick to your scout promise always, even after you've ceased to be a boy, and God help you to do it. Throughout the history of Troop 103, there's been a continued tradition of service to others within the Williamsburg community. One of the more significant projects that Troop 103 does is Andy's Earth Day. Uh, the Andy Outlaw, um, Andy's Earth Day as we call it, is in honor and the memory of Andrew Outlaw, uh, better known as Andy. Uh, Andy was a a go-getter scout in Troop 103. He was also extremely community service oriented. Uh, he volunteered at the hospital. He was in Fife and Drum. He did uh, volunteers at convalescent uh, homes in Williamsburg. 
So he was very outside of scouting involved. In scouting, he was super involved. Uh, but he was also uh, a, a nature lover. But he could see nature in a way that most people could not, including adults. But he loved to hike. So back then, Troop 103 backpacked the older scouts four or five times a year. And he would always look at the, the funny stuff. A piece of fungus might catch his eye, or uh, the way a tree grew may take, change, you know, catch his eye, or, or a tree root, or a bird, or a rock. Or, but he could see something in it that others could not see. And it, it was just his being in touch with nature and being able to see the surroundings around him without just looking through it. So uh, 11, 11 years ago, I think it is now, uh, on Christmas Eve, uh, Andy died in a uh, tragic accident. Um, and it was just uh, senseless. It was canoeing on a river on Christmas Eve and uh, the canoe flipped over and he kept his head about him, his skill level of how to empty a canoe. And so they emptied the canoe, him and the other guy got back in to the canoe and they got to shore and he got his buddy to go up to the house. Unfortunately, the hypothermia had already set in on Andrew and he just passed away in the canoe. And it was the most, uh, it, was, it was probably the most devastating time of my scouting career. And uh, it brings up a lot of bad memories right now, just even thinking about it. Um, it just jolted this community like beyond belief. So I, that's nothing to dwell on. The idea is you don't dwell on the bad. It was sad that we lost Andrew but Andrew was more than that. So there was a church site that his dad had excavated. It was now owned by the, a community organization, but it had to be restored. And so Troop 103 took it under its wing that this was gonna be our spot to honor Andy. So every April, close to Earth Day and also Andy's birthday, we have Andy's Earth Day. And we go out and we have transformed an old church site that was just a field into a park-like setting. I'm Alan Outlaw with uh, Troop 103. The, uh, I'm a committee member, have been for years. I quickly became involved with Troop 103 when my son entered the troop and uh, served in various capacities, including chairman. Um, and ultimately, when a once Andrew had achieved the rank of Eagle, I continued uh, with that, with the troop uh, in the role of uh, uh, mem memorializing Andrew's uh, time in the troop with Andy's Earth Day. When Andrew died, we tried to think of ways to celebrate his life, and one was to create Andy Andy's Earth Day, which is uh, close to his birthday every year. Uh, birthday being April 17th, so about mid-April every year, Troop 103 uh, visits Church on the Main, this 18th century church site adjacent to a trail system uh, which the troop created. We literally blazed the trail through the woods here several miles worth, built bridges, uh, cut the trail, and ultimately it was uh, so successful that James City County chose to pave the trail and redo a major bridge that we had uh, constructed as an Eagle project um, to make it more permanent. So now we have a trail system created by Tree Point 03 leading to Church on the Main, this archaeological site that has uh, been turned into a park by the troop. Um, Andy's Earth Day we use to uh, focus on two important areas in scouting, uh, nature and history. And uh, what we do here at Church on the Main is maintenance project, um, 
as well as educational projects where we teach actually two merit badges, American history and uh, geology we've chosen for the nature part of it. So it's a, a study of both nature and history, uh, emphasizing those two fields of interest uh, to the scouts. So uh, we continue Andrew's uh, interest in nature and um, promoting nature. We, we just completed our 12th Andes Earth Day, but the background of this site is that um, uh, before the 12 years of Troop 103's uh, ensuring that this site was preserved, uh, it was found and actually I found it in 1975 and um, way before the housing development here and all that. Um, it's an unusual story of uh, success in historic preservation where uh, the site went from being uh, privately owned by uh, Mr. and Mrs. White here, a local uh, farming family, uh, was sold to a developer. But by that time I had found the site uh, and um, the owner insisted that it be preserved uh, and not developed. So this 1.4 acre parcel was carved out of the housing development and uh, preserved until we could get to it and actually find the, the church site in uh, 2003, the summer of 2003. So uh, happily, what uh, it went from the developer to the Williamsburg Land Conservancy, which is a land preservation uh, group in the region here. And um, they allowed us to and funded an archaeological excavation where we found the church, the cemetery, and the uh, enclosure. Troop 103 is chartered by Williamsburg United Methodist Church. In return, the troop is always there to provide scouts to help with the church's many community outreach efforts. The more visible ways in which the troop interacts with the church is through the yearly Scout Sunday service and the Veterans Day ceremonies. You know, I think there's really two events a year that, that really help uh, our troops shine. And you mentioned Veterans Day is one, and then Scout Sunday is the other. And that's an opportunity for, for me to stand in front of the troop, um, in front of the church, and, and show you guys off. Uh, and every time we have one of those events, twice a year, as I said, uh, I take great pride in doing that, and I always have people walk up to me later uh, and say, gee, that was wonderful to see those scouts. They are, we're so proud to have them be part of our church, so proud of what they've accomplished. They were so well behaved. Um, and, and that's saying something when you're sitting in a church of the size of the United Methodist Church, um, having 60, 70, or 80 guys sit, uh, sit up in the front rows, and, and it just looks terrific, and, and the church is proud of it, and I'm always proud to be there as well. The church members really like it. Uh getting to see, see, if you ever turn around and look when they ask, you know, the ones that were scouts to stand up, a lot of them were members of Troop 103. The hallmark requirement for becoming an Eagle Scout is completing an Eagle project. While a life scout, plan, develop, and give leadership to others in a service project helpful to any religious institution, any school, or your community the project must benefit an organization other than Boy Scouting. Attaining Eagle was probably my pinnacle of scouting. Uh, that was my goal when I came in, was to get Eagle, and I followed my brother. Uh, and actually, when I got my Eagle, that we were the first brothers to become Eagle Scouts in the troop, which was pretty neat. Uh, I got my Eagle in 1974 and it was my Eagle charge was done at the 50th anniversary of Troop 103's banquet. Getting Eagle, it's one of those things that as a youth you get it and you say, yeah, I, okay, I met my goal and I'm ready to move on to the next thing and it's nice, you can always call yourself an Eagle Scout. But as you get older, you start to realize exactly what you've done. And the older I get today, which 
is 56 is the more I appreciate it. And I appreciate it more and more as other scouts get their eagle. Uh, but being an eagle scout in Troop 103, oh my gosh, I tell you what, it, it did set you up above a scout that did not get eagle. And, pe and the scouts recognize that. And I think today the scouts recognize the same thing. They, they, they know the difference between an eagle scout and a scout that's not eagle yet. My project was a, um, I actually developed a program for my band that got our band to do concerts in all the elementary schools in our school system to introduce music to younger kids. We'd never had that program in there and I kind of got denied on my Eagle Board because they looked at my project and said, well, that wasn't enough. But I, once I sat down and I looked at my project, I had handwritten it up. Uh, and back then, nobody really helped you with your, your Eagle stuff. You did it all yourself. And so when I actually sat down, the board said, is this really all that you did? And, and we started talking about it. I said, no, this is what I did. They said, go back and write that. And uh, when I submitted the paperwork with the project written up of what I did, it, they all signed off on it, which means they were all done. It just was a paperwork issue. Part of being an Eagle Scout is, is they want you to have everything correct. So it is that important that the paperwork even has to be right. I chose this project because the, uh, this past school year we came out um, for religion class and we left prayer stones by the, uh, by the base of that tree just right behind us. I just came out here and even though it's called the prayer garden, it was just leaves were everywhere, it was overgrown, it just didn't look very nice and I thought a school like this with a Christ-centered education should, should look nice, it should look beautiful because that's what it's here for. I talked to my religion teacher and I told her, I, right after I went out there, I said, I, I've been thinking about an Eagle project um, that I need to do, and I think this is the perfect one. A couple months I was just working on the proposal and I kept making small changes and stuff. I was trying to figure out what all I wanted to do, what all I didn't think we'd be able to do. This whole project, out of all the work days we did, ended up being about 130 hours worth of work. To any newer scouts that might be looking, watching this video, any um, Cub Scouts or Weeblos that will become Boy Scouts, You'll hear a lot of stuff about Eagle Scout service projects and as long as you have a good advisor and good parents that are there to help you and guide you make sure you're making the right decisions, um, it's not something to worry about. It's sure that there's going to be a little stress just like with anything, but it, the feeling at the end is just far more fulfilling than any of the um, struggles in the beginning of getting, getting it approved, getting it off the ground and just getting everything organized. My name is Larry Luck. I'm an attorney here in Williamsburg. I work on the advancement team. Okay. What I work on right now is uh, coordinating boards of review. The purpose of the board of review is to, uh, to do a couple of things. One is to uh, be quality control for the troop so that we can identify issues that may not be addressed properly as the scouts are advancing. Another purpose of the board of review is to provide some positive reinforcement to the scout that is going through the process and focus him on uh, some of the achievements that he has uh, accomplished to get to uh, the rank recognition, but also to focus on the things that he's going to be asked to do in his next rank. So if it's a second class moving up to first class, we talk about uh, how as a first class scout he'll be able to assist other scouts with their requirements and he'll be able to sign things off and how that's a pretty significant responsibility. And so we look at the past but keep them focused on the future. Service is an integral requirement in all rank advancement within Troop 103. Even Tenderfoot scouts help with plant sales, spaghetti dinners, and a variety of other service projects that benefit the community. Well, we certainly spend a lot of time uh, happily supporting uh, Williamsburg United Methodist Church. Um, they, any community service effort that they're involved in, we try and volunteer for as well as needed. 
Um, so things like um, Stop Hunger Now is a program we've been involved in both at the Methodist Church, Williamsburg Presbyterian Church, and uh, Wallen Hills Baptist Church. Uh, and it's something that we as scouts can do uh, very, very well and be very helpful in. Moving large amounts of, of uh, grain, in that case, doing heavy lifting. Uh, we certainly we paint rooms, we do whatever the church needs, spaghetti dinners, um, we're always available to help. The Boy Scouts, is this troop has always been very service oriented, always been to help the community, there for the community, there for people. Anything that would need a need or a want or something like that, with the, the troop has come together to to do something. A good example, of it, it, this is one of my pet ones, projects, is every year we have to do a swim test. And for us to go out and pay to do a swim test over and above, say like at the YMCA or this, that, and the other, would cost us about two, three hundred dollars to rent the pool to do the whole troop. Well, I live in Indigo Park and we have a local pool. So I have made a deal, pretty much made a deal with the board saying, if you'll let us use the pool for the swim test and, and this, we will do a service project every year. And we blow the leaves out of the pool and rake the leaves and, and clean all the debris out from around the pool. Well, this, this uh, normally involves about 10 to 20 boys. Everybody's got rakes and leaf blowers and shovels and, and tarps and stuff. They come there and we all load it up and clean all the, that. And the pool is very appreciative of it because it, it's, it's a large feat. The annual Williamsburg Christmas Parade provides an opportunity to put Troop 103 on display for the entire community. The elaborate floats and mashed potato snow machine have become somewhat legendary. Well, one of the things I think that was sort of cool is that when, when I had uh, joined the troop, it had been doing business, as far as I could see, the same way for many, many, many years. And a lot of us in, in the uh, adult side of the family, the, the assistant scoutmasters, Dave Nunn was a scoutmaster, tried to push the envelope a little bit, tried to try to do some different things. Um, I think one of the neatest things that we, we did was uh, start some new traditions. Uh, Right now, the Christmas parade's been high on the list of, of got to do's every year, but there was a time where we really didn't do much. Back in, in the old days, the troop had a big old bus, a red school bus called Big Red, and when I first joined the troop, the Christmas parade was every once in a while, they'd load all the scouts in the bus and just ride in the parade, and that was, that was it. And we didn't participate for a couple of years, and then sometimes somebody said, well, let, let's, let's do it again. And, we put together a float with a, with some trees on it and a and a tent, and uh, we got this propane fire, and it was like nothing anybody had ever seen. You know, here were these guys camping on this trailer with this fire going, and it really really set uh, set the tone. And I think that was the first year we really got excited about the Christmas parade. The next, the next year we put Dave Nunn in a canoe and put skateboards underneath it and and did the same camping things with fire and he and pulled him along uh, Duke of Gloucester Street and then from there of course it's just been bigger and bigger every year we made the governor's palace that almost got tipped over going around the corner uh, but the Christmas parade was a good example of, of something new we did. Uh, the Williamsburg Christmas Parade in Troop 103 uh, it, the parade celebrated its 50th anniversary of uh, of being a parade this year and uh, Troop 103 has been in it for about 18 years now. Uh, we started, uh, the reason we got into the Christmas parade, we used to always camp in December. December started becoming so busy that trying to get a camping trip in it was pretty tough. So we still, the Green Bar decided they still needed an activity and so their activity was to march in the Christmas parade. So we marched in the Christmas parade for three or four years, and then they said, marching is not fun in the Christmas parade, so let's build something. So they started building floats, and our first one was a canoe. So we built a platform on rollers, and we stuck a canoe on it, and they stuck the scoutmaster, Mr. Nunn, in the middle of it, and they pulled Mr. Nunn a mile and a quarter through the parade on a canoe. It was, uh, it was kind of funny. Our uh, our floats then became bigger and better because it's a 
sort of, again, we go back to tradition of Troop 103. Troop 103 likes to raise the bar all the time. So the boys came up with an idea for the next float and the next float and the next float. And now they still come up with every idea. I believe they, since they started awarding prizes and placing for the floats, Troop 103 has won the last 13 years, 14 years um, in a row as first place. And we can honestly say it's a Boy Scout built float. It's not adults that build a children's float, it's boys that build their own float. Uh, we have a great place now to build it. Uh, we take material, we cut, we saw, we nail, we staple, we air gun everything together. We, we paint as good as we can paint and we hope the paint is dry on Saturday morning when it's time for that float to happen. Uh, the one, my biggest regret about doing this, because I've been doing float building for 10, 12 years now, is I don't have hardly any pictures of any of the floats. Uh, I have one of this year's. I found I have a total of three pictures of all the floats that we've done, and that's it. Uh, this year they went above and beyond, and we're hauling, the floats consist of the truck, a flatbed trailer that's 24 feet long, and now we're hooking another trailer to that trailer in order to make the float longer. So the float was 56 feet long this year. Yeah, uh, but what I hear as an adult though, is that people look forward to our float. People that know me, again, and, and I know a lot of people in the community about the Christmas parade, they wonder, they always ask, is Troop 103 gonna have another float? Because your float is always the best float. It's always unique. So, um, yeah, and I tell them, that, you know, that's up to Green Bar, that every year Green Bar decides through, they represent the boys in the troop, and they come up with the whole plan. You know, some year we may not have a mountain trip, some year we may not be in a Christmas parade. It all depends on what that green bar decides that the troop's gonna do for that year. They'll probably have to answer to the troop about why are we missing so much fun building a float and uh, if we're not doing it, but uh, they better have a really good plan to cover that. But uh, I don't foresee in the near future that we won't be in the Christmas parade. Although Troop 103 has been around for over 90 years, its scouting program is just as relevant today as it was in 1924. All in all, it's been a very enjoyable, oh gee, 1952, 1972, to now been in scouting and I'm still registered so that's getting up there in a couple of years almost on me the the impact on me is it, i want to say it gives me a sense of belonging you know i was like you say i was a scout when i was a child and i i have been involved in scouting all my life except for four years it's scouting has just always been around me. I've always been involved in scouting, whether it was, you know, I was involved as a, as a Cub Scout, I was involved as a Boy Scout, I was involved as an adult leader, I was involved as a Scoutmaster, uh, Assistant Scoutmaster, and I just, uh, I will be buried in my Scout uniform. My wife already just said that. You will be buried in your Scout uniform. My, my, real, my real wishes would be to be cremated in my scout uniform and take my ashes and spread off of tooth of time would be the what I would like to have see done because I think my body de b belongs in something that's involved in scouting. Wow, I, I mean, there are people who've been involved with the troop that, that are all over the place. <laughs> Jim's a builder, uh, Dave Nunn worked for C&P, uh, Doug's with Colonial Williamsburg. I'm a, a, a retailer. Uh, we've had people in the military. Uh, all walks of life. There's no one uh, one group, but they all. I think they all sort of um, do.
do it for for many reasons one i think there's a, a frankly i think they have fun uh, i think they all look at the idea of, of working with kids young adults uh, as something that's that they get as much out of as they put in and so hopefully this whole experience for both the adults and the the kids is a positive one um, but you know i do it because i have a good time it's a lot of fun i, I sort of think that the whole main concept with scouting is fun with a purpose you know you have fun but you teach things you learn things and it's it's uh, I enjoy being with the kids I think if you stick with the scouting program regardless of whether you you go all the way and, and, and earn your Eagle rank or not you learn some terrifically important life skills Baden Powell when he got you know excited about creating a scouting program felt that more than anything else kids needed what he called character and that was to be a, a better citizen, a better leader, um, a better person. And I think that's, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, you, you've got the service project, so people understand that, that part of what they need to be doing is paying back to the community in terms of service, you know, helping other people, being, being supportive, just being straight up trustworthy. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's it's fun with the purpose. At the end of the day, you have a lot of fun. But I think as a as a product of being in the scouting program, kids are better prepared to go further in life, I and mean, they they really get a sense of what it's all about. You got to learn to work with one another. You you got to learn to eat burned pancakes or cook. Uh, it, there's a it, it's the most well-rounded program for development uh, that you could ever ask for. Every year we cross in, and I say crossover, from Weeblows, a, a boy that is 10 and a half years old, and he comes in as a scout that is short, very small in stature usually, and has had one camping trip of which mom and dad were there and did everything. You know, they really don't know much about self-sufficiency and the Boy Scout program is designed to teach that. Troop 103 excels in teaching this and I, they excel in teaching it because Troop 103 is still boy run. A new scout learns from the oldest scout and that's just the way it's taught and it, this older scout can say something that this younger scout is going to listen to and remember. Sometimes they don't listen to the adults or don't remember what the adults say, but because the older scout is the mentor at this point. Not me. I'm not the mentor. I'm, a, I'm an assistant scout master. I help make this program work. But the older scout is the actual mentor in this program. That's why it works. The first year scouts come in and you can even ask our second year scouts when these guys cross over and they look back at them and they go, Oh my gosh, look at these guys. They don't know anything. They, 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 they're, they're just going around like bullets in here and there's no organization to them. And, and our second year scouts are recognizing that. But that shows the advancement that happens in a scout or to a scout in one year's time. Because those guys that are now saying that were just like that one year ago. So, what they have learned and how they have matured to the scouting program in, in 12 months time is incredible. From that point on, they are still learning mentor to, to student. And it's all still older scout to younger scout. As this grows, they still learn, but now the respect starts to come more for the, as the scout gets older to another scout and then they start to work together in creating what works for Troop 103. And that is boy taught, boy run. I, I think having this history of Troop 103 is long overdue. Uh, we're gonna, you know, things transition. Uh, I won't be here forever. Um, I mean, I'll be here as long as I can. I don't plan on going anywhere now. Uh, I would like to be here for the troops 100th anniversary, without a doubt. Uh, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> the, the, my closing thoughts on Troop 103 
is that a lot of very good young men have grown up in Troop 103. And I really sincerely believe that this tradition that Troop 103 has of boy run, boy mentored, uh, it's a cycle. It is a cycle. If you sit there and look at it, and even the interviewer here, Tim, can sit back and look at the time that he's been in the troop, the cycle of how this actually works now. We produce young men that become leaders. And that's what the Boy Scouts do. Uh, the whole organization is dependent on of the cycle that creates better leaders out of young men. Not everybody, not every scout that sits out there in, a, in our troop meeting is going to be senior patrol leader, and not every scout's going to even make patrol leader, and not every scout's going to make eagle. But what they're going to get out of it is leadership skills, life skills, and how to work with others. But the biggest thing, they're getting all of this having the time of their lives, doing things they'll never, ever, ever get to do again, unless after they're married, join a Boy Scout troop and do it with their son. They're doing things that are gonna last a lifetime and make just us a better place to be. Since 1924, thousands of boys have passed through Troop 103 and continued on to become remarkable young men. The scouting program has touched their lives in a profound way, and they in turn have and will touch the lives of countless others in a positive way. Troop 103, a good thing since 1924. All right, go do your homework. <laughs> homework always comes first. Wow.